Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. If you can hear me through the Zoom session, I want you to raise your hand so we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Pretty good. Good, good, good. Um, you can lower your hand. Thank you. Now, any questions, comments, concerns about what we did in the last class? Okay, by now, I hope you have had the opportunity to uh, browse through the material posted on uh, Moodle. Um, hopefully take um, a quiz, homework quiz, once or twice at a bunch of different times, and got a chance to play around with the material, and got some familiarity with them. Okay, you have the weekend to try that out as well. You have the weekend to work on the lab as well. Okay, so lab one which we'll be beginning on Monday, okay? So let's begin from where we left off in the last class. Before that, let's quickly review what we did in the last class, okay? So we started out with the idea of basic amplifiers, okay? Basic amplifiers, let's see. Um, an amplifier takes a small signal as an input and it amplifies it to a, um, it's a signal processing that magnifies the amplitudes of the signal. Okay. Now, um, the ratio of output um, amplitude over input amplitude, that's uh, um, defined as the gain. Okay. Signals can usually be voltage, current, or power. And I showed you the two different types of amplifiers possible. Differential amplifiers, single-ended amplifiers. Amplifiers are always, um, the inputs and outputs are measured as difference between two terminals. If one of the terminals is ground, then we call it a single-ended. We can have a mix and match. We can have an input differential, output single-ended amplifier, so on and so forth. Okay, and then I mentioned there are different kinds of amplifiers. There's a voltage um, amplifier, there's a current amplifier, there's a power amplifier. Okay, that's something um, we talked about how to express gain in dB. For both the voltage gain and the current gain, we take the absolute value of gain and do a 20 log base 10 of that absolute gain. It gives us in dB, okay? For power gain, we just simply do 10 log base 10 um, absolute value of the power gain, okay? So, and I mentioned in this last class, and we are going to see that in today's class, a 20 dB increase in decade or in, in, in terms of dB amounts to a 10x increase in absolute value of the gain, okay? If the absolute value of the gain is reducing by 6 dB, or, 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 or um, if the dB value is negative 6, it simply means a two-fold decrease, okay? So that's, that's some um, rule of the thumb. Uh, values when you're doing dB to absolute conversion, okay? And then I mentioned about the absolute um, supplies, amplifier supplies shown in green is the roof or the um, positive power supply, which acts as a ceiling, top ceiling for the signal, maximum output signal shown in purple. Okay, shown in purple here is the floor or um, bottom um, value that the signal can take. Okay, so depending on what you apply as VCC or VCE, they set the output peak um, for the signal output possible. Okay, and I illustrated that with the use of uh, this. Uh, transfer characteristics, transfer curve, okay? Along the x-axis is the input, along the y-axis is the output, okay? 
the slant line, blue thick slant line, that's the game profile. That's the profile of the game. Okay, so it's a, it has a constant gain. It's a, it has a constant slope. The slope of that line indicates the gain. Okay, so a small signal along the input. Okay, a small signal along the input is amplified um, to be a large signal along the output okay on the other hand if the input signal is too large if the input signal is um, too large what happens is the output swings um, extremely wide thereby clipping at the power supplies okay and i demonstrated that idea in the last class using a bunch of different examples Okay, so this is what we did in the last class the idea of clipping due to power supply. And in addition to that, in addition to that, we saw an amplifier model. Okay, any amplifier has an input resistance and an output resistance. Okay, when you're trying to drive a signal on this, the signal itself is not ideal. It does come with some kind of source resistance. So this source resistance eats into the gain. This is what I mentioned. There is going to be some signal loss because of Ri and R0. Okay. And I'm going to illustrate that using an example today in the class. Okay, but what we want to understand is um, there is going to be some signal loss because of the RS, which is the source resistance, and there's also going to be some signal loss because of R0, which is the output resistance. Okay, so we'll talk about that uh, with an example. Okay, this guy, we'll use this guy as an example. Okay, and in order to do that, let me see if I can, uh, um, where can I go here? I go to uh, class signals and amplifiers notes. Okay, so we'll continue from where we left off here. So this is a clean version of the notes. Okay, and we're going to look at this example, signal loss example. Okay, because of uh, um, R source and R input. Okay, let me do this. Take a screenshot of that. Okay. Copy that. Okay. So, in an effort to understand the signal loss in this amplifier, let me do um, add a page here. Okay, let's begin working on this problem with an analogy. I always like analogies, okay? An interesting analogy, okay? So this is three stages, right? There are three stages in here. So we are trying to understand signal loss due to, signal loss due to um, the source of resistances are input, are output, so on. Okay, so here is a three stage amplifier. Okay, and my contention, my claim is that some of these resistances. Okay, some of these resistances, they contribute to signal loss. Okay, and I'm going to explain that. So there are four resistances that I highlighted here. And my claim is that each of these resistances contributes to the signal loss. Okay, that's my claim. Okay, this is a three-stage amplifier. 
like break it down so in order to understand the loss first i'm going to do something um, now i'm going to analyze the circuit in the absence of a loss in the absence of these um, resistances everybody with me so far so um, in order to understand the loss that is happening here what i'm going to do is i'm going to pretend like there is no resistance here there's no resistance here there's no resistance here there's no resistance here okay this is what i'm going to pretend and i'll show you um, the over the gain that is possible here and then um, compare that to the signal loss that we might suffer when we um, have these additional resistances okay so here is the analogy that i'm going to use okay to make things very interesting very intuitive i'm going to talk about an example of um, a financial investment okay so look at this um, v source here that's your funding source okay let's say you found some a million dollar cash available to um, invest that's your source okay and you invested um, over um, the course of your investing career over your lifetime you invested in a bunch of different companies let's say you invested in um, apple okay and what this tells me here is that apple gave a gain of 10 okay later on um, you realized the gains okay um, long-term capital gains you you realized gains and you put that money into some other investment okay some other investment that gave you a hundred times returns okay some other investment okay anything except bitcoin okay you're more likely to lose bitcoin lose in bitcoin than gain if you don't know what you're doing okay so let's say um and by the way um a um a uh, comment here is that i'm not a um, financial expert you should not uh, consider this example as an investment advice okay so um let's say that's your second stage investment which gives you 100 times return and then you found that enough is enough you went on to invest in um, treasury bonds which have a very limited gain which only have a gain of i don't know one they're mostly for capital preservation okay so that should kind of explain the three stages of amplifiers okay let's follow this let's follow this um, along and see how we can look at the final um, final um, result so this is where the input this is where you put in your initial investment okay the final output when you cash out that is across the 100 ohm resistance okay so that's where you take the final payout okay and you're always interested as a shrewd financial operator you're always interested in this ratio how much payout did i get as a function of the initial investment okay okay and even as engineers we are always interested in this guy vl that's that's uh, the final payout right the voltage vl that's the final payout so vl over what exactly did i put in that is what i'm interested in finding okay so let's begin um i started out with one million dollars all of that million dollars is going into this investment um, firm into apple okay so that apple um you bought some one million dollars worth of shares and then over the course of 10 years 20 years five years i don't know it has increased tenfold so you are left with 10 million dollars here okay 10 million dollars and then you 
um, realize that $10 million gain. So that's the first stage, stage one gain. Okay. Um, stage one gain, you realize that gain and you put that investment, $10 million into another, um, into another investment. I don't know, ExxonMobil. Okay, somehow, um, some other Tesla, okay, all of this. So that company gave you a hundredfold increase, okay? So your $10 million is going to multiply 10 times. Now you're, um, um, all of a sudden, you're, you join the ranks of billionaires, okay? Uh, thanks to your shrewd investments, okay? Now that billion dollars, you thought enough is enough. I have, um, I'm happy with the gains I have got. I'm going to invest this $1 billion into a much more conservative, into a much more um, secure capital preserving investment like treasury bonds, which have a very low yield. Typically for this example, one um, yield, that's the gain. The gain of this guy is just one, meaning that the uh, there's not going to be any increase in your investment, okay? So eventually, you're left with $1 billion, okay? Your retirement is going to be wonderful, amazing. Um, the dream of um, a million people come true, okay? Now, you're enjoying your dream investment. All of that $1 billion is what you eventually have for the payout. Okay, so if you eventually calculate the um, efficiency or the gain, the final uh, payout, which is $1 billion over what you actually put in, uh, $1 million, you have a gain of 1,000. Okay, you can see that this gain of 1,000 really is the product of a 10x gain given by Apple, a 100x gain given by this magic uh, mystery investment and a 1x gain given by so 10 times 100 times 1 um, is the overall gain so that's what you're interested in overall gain okay overall gain is 1000 and now you're a billionaire that's your final payout okay does that make sense so this is all under the assumption that there is no source resistance okay questions please questions so far okay let's look at this let's follow the exact same investment in the presence of source resistances okay Let's uh, do this. Let me copy this over here and I'm going to add another page. Uh, like coupling, there's there's a term like coupling, something, cu coupling amplifier. Is it the same thing? Yeah, there are three amplifiers cascaded here. I, I'm not talking about coupling yet. I'll talk about coupling shortly. Okay. I'll talk about um, coupling shortly. Um, when two stages are coupled, these are direct coupled. These amplifiers are directly coupled. If you have to pass them, if you have to couple them through some capacitance, okay, we'll talk about that shortly, okay? So that's your overall gain, 1,000, in the absence of any signal loss, okay? Now let's see signal loss due to all right. And R zero. R out. Okay. R out. So we are not um, eliminating these resistances anymore. We are keeping them intact. Okay, that's the idea. So we'll still begin with our one million dollar um, windfall that you had all of a sudden available for investment okay then there are three stages you still your action plan your game plan is still the same you're going to invest it in three stages in apple in exxon mobil i don't know exxon mobil arbitrarily chosen and in treasury bonds 
three stages, right? Um, but the problem here is your broker all of a sudden, earlier you assumed that all your trades, selling in and selling out, cashing in and cashing out, you assumed that they were free of charge. But along comes your broker and charges you some commission. Okay, signal loss due to RI and R out can be thought of as um, lost expenses. Okay, if you're investing in some other um, exchange traded fund, some kind of fund, there could be some expensive issues. So the, in addition to the trading value of the shares themselves, there is some additional add-on commission that you lose. Okay, so $1 million that we began earlier, in the absence of a um, commission, this $1 million was all invested into Apple right here. Okay, but see what happens when um, commission comes in. Okay, this $1 million that you have for investment, that doesn't show up here. You don't have a million dollars here. Instead, you have a smaller value. What you have really is a small fraction, one mega ohm by one mega ohm times 100 plus one kilo ohm. So in other words, you have, a, you have some signal lost, some of your money lost in the commissions here, okay? And only the remaining amount is going to show up as this guy. So what's this fraction now then? What's the value of this? Um, one by one mega plus, well, if you do if you put that into, plug that into calculator, one divided by 1.1. 1. 1. So it's only, um, so Okay. It's only about $90 million. So this comes out to be 0 0.909 million dollars. Okay. So that's less than a million dollars. So what you have here is 0 0.909 million dollars. Okay. So as you can see, yes. Uh, can you explain how do you get this uh, value like one about yeah. Yeah, voltage division. It's simple voltage division, okay? You want to find out the voltage VI1 over here. That's simply one mega by one mega plus 100K. That's the voltage division, okay? All right, so voltage is um, the total $1 million is split between the one mega ohm resistance and the 100 kilo ohm resistance. That 100 kilo ohm resistance is commissions that is not contributing to your investment at all. That is just money that your trader, um, that your trading company charges. Okay, now we are only left with 0.9 million dollars to invest, and Apple does its magic and gives you a tenfold return. So now you have 9.09 .09 million dollars here. Okay, earlier, if you remember, earlier. I had $10 million because um, a small chunk of it was not consumed by commissions. But here, a small chunk of it is coming, consumed by commission. What can you do? It's necessary evil. So you have a $9.09 .09 million to invest um, coming out of Apple. You cashed out there. And that is available here as um, $9.09 .09 million. Or is it? Okay. So, that's $9.09 .09 million available here. Now, um, all of that $9.9 million .9 you want to take and invest in to ExxonMobil, okay? And that investment, again, has to go through your, um, your um, trade um, trader here, okay? Who is going to charge a commission? Okay, so what is going to happen is you can't, you don't have $9.09 .09 million here. Instead, you have a smaller value. What you have is 
so we are talking about the second stage okay second stage exxon mobile stage what you have in the second stage really is 9.09 .09. Okay, times voltage division. So if you look at this, this is um, 9.09 .09 over here. Okay, what really comes through to VI2 is only a small fraction of that. That's the idea I'm trying to drive home. Okay, what fraction of that comes through really is um, this number 9.09 .09 million into voltage division see it is 100 kilo ohms by 100 kilo ohms plus one kilo ohm okay so um this eventually what you're left with here is a smaller number what's that number 9.09 .09 times 100 divided by 101 okay so that's going to be nine million dollars okay um you have nine million dollars here okay let's follow the um process here you started out with one million dollars okay and along the process of investment you lost some to commission and you're only left with 0.9 million to invest in apple that gave you a 10 times return which became 9.09 .09 million and you lost that 0 0.09 millions to commission and this 9 million you are ready to invest in exxon mobil okay which gives you a 100 fold return so that gives you this exxon mobil gives you a 100 fold return so it becomes 900 million dollars okay over here if you see um, this 100 return is going to become 900 million dollars okay good um now this 900 million dollars you want to take it and invest it into bonds okay before you invest it into bonds it has to go through some commission okay let's see how that works okay this commission you so you have your 900 million dollars now so this is um stage two stage two um, gives you a 900 million dollar output and when that 900 million dollar output you can't get all of it out of stage two you only get a fraction of 10 kilo ohms which is this guy by 10 plus one kilo ohms okay 10k plus one k okay so what you have here is dollar 900 million times 10 by 11 how much ever that comes down to okay um, 900 into 10 by 11 right so i have 818 million dollars so what i'm saying is this 900 million dollar when it comes to um your hands you only have 818 million dollars 0.18 million dollars because some of it is lost in this resistance here some of it is lost as commission over there okay 818 million dollars okay now that guy is invested for an for a gain of one so i have 818.18 million dollars showing up here okay now you're ready to cash out when you're ready to cash out you cannot get all of that 818 million dollars okay it has to still go through commissions taxes so on and so forth so what you do is you take a, a voltage division on top of that 818.18 million dollars okay so you do this 818.18 million dollars and you do a voltage division on top of that determined by this 100 and this 10 so i have 100 by 110 okay so if you do that now you, the value that you eventually get is 743 okay so this is 743 million dollars okay or in other words the voltage here okay you got that voltage by calculating the 
um, um, voltage division of 818 across these two resistances, the 10 ohms and the 100 ohms to resistances. Okay, so um, again, going back, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I'm going to um, clean all of this a little bit, 9.09. Uh, if you look at the green highlights, that is what represents the commission. Okay, so let's take a look here. I started out with 1 million and eventually I ended up with $743 million. So if you look at the overall gain, so this guy is really VL. Okay, VL is $743 million. And then um, VI2, so on and so forth. Overall gain is defined as VL over VS, so which is $743 million over $1 million. So that's going to be $743. Okay, so the point I'm trying to drive home here is that in the absence of these commissions, um, trading charges, taxes, so on and so forth, you ended up ended up being a billionaire. Your final payout was one billion dollars. Okay, for an overall gain of one thousand. Right, but because of these commissions taxes and a lot of other add-on um, price um, uh, earnings earnings and price uh, other lot of other price factors um, what you have is you're not quite the billionaire you're still 743 million richer okay um, not a bad deal but not um, the best you could have been a billionaire so the overall gain is what the electrical engineers and the um, financial um, um, analysts and investors are in, interested in, okay? So there is something called the intrinsic gain. There is something called the maximum gain that you can get out of this. What's the maximum gain that you can get out of this? 1,000. But what is the overall gain from the very um, beginning where you threw some money in to the very end where you cashed out? including signal lost taxes and commissions that's only 743 and that's the idea is to illustrate the point that there is some signal loss somewhere from time to time does that make sense okay so this vi1 this one this guy is 9.09 .09 million dollars that's this guy that's the idea here Okay, and then there is VI2, VI2, which is $9 million. Okay, so let me write that over here. VI2 is uh, $9 million. So this is, I'm sorry, this guy is VI1. Questions about that, please. And the voltage division on that is VI2, which comes out to be $9 million. Okay. I have a question. Nine million dollars. Yes. So, what's the purpose of uh, cascading uh, multiple uh, amplifiers instead of having one with, uh, let's say, one thousand uh, gain? That's a very good question. You might want to also ask as to why. Um, Okay, let me add a quick page here. So typically what we do is for a given technology, okay? It's always better to have different, um, a bunch of different stages, amplification stages, because um, it's only possible to get so much gain out of one stage okay um 10 to the 7 10 to the 4 okay um there's a limit on how much gain you can get out of one stage so if you're thinking about an operational amplifier with a differential stage followed by a common sort of second stage so in other words um there is a limit to the maximum gain that you can get in one stage so if you cascade three of those stages, 
three of exactly the same stages. Let's say you want a really big gain. Then what you do is you take three of those stages and put them in cascade. Then you have a much bigger gain. Okay, so there's a limit on the maximum amount of gain that we can get. Okay, out of one stage. And if you want a bigger gain, you always end up having to inevitably use more stages. Also, this guy, investing in bonds for a gain of one. Okay, this is the gain, right? Pay attention to this one times VI3. What it really is saying is, whatever is VI3 here is multiplied by a factor of one. That's the gain of that stage. What's the point of using a stage with a gain of one? Okay, that seems, that seems futile or useless. Okay, but there's a good reason for why we use that. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but also pay attention to here. Okay, this VI2, which is um, $9 million, that is amplified a hundred times here. That's the gain of the second stage. Okay, a VI2 is multiplied hundredfold. So this 9 million becomes 900 million. Okay, each of these stages has some gain, and that gain sets the um, stage of the gain, and then there is some signal loss due to commissions. Okay, questions, please. Okay, okay, we'll continue from here. So, excuse me for the um, for the clumsy writing. I hope you're able to um, understand this uh, with some clarity. Okay. Maybe we can get rid of all of these unnecessary annotations. Okay. So that's the idea of uh, signal loss because of uh, RI and R out. Okay. So here is the idea. This guy is the input resistance, the source of resistance looking in to the um, amplifier, going into the amplifier. This RS is coming from the signal source here. Okay, so that's part of the um, signal source. The signal source is not ideal, it can be ideal. So some of that signal is lost across the signal source. Okay, I have a question for you. Take a look at this first stage. Take a look at it. even before you go into the first stage. The first stage is really amplification is taking place here, right? That is where the amplification is taking place in the first stage. But even before you actually get to first stage, even before that, okay? How can you maximize this $1 million? How do you get a big chunk of that to show up here? Okay, what can you do as a design engineer? Let's say you have no choice. You cannot pick this value. Or maybe you can, okay? Let's say you can pick this value and this value. You had some choice. How would you relatively size these two resistances so that you end up with a big percentage of your input? showing up as your investment. Uh, okay. You make the, the source resistor much smaller. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You pay me look at this ratio here. If you make this number as big as possible, then um, you're going to end up with a big chunk of that coming here. So what you want to do is you want to make your um, R input, which is this guy, much greater than R source, which is this guy, R source. If you do that, if you make sure that the resistance in the investment itself is much large compared to the resistance about the, compare, about the, about the commission, then the denominator is um, 
the denominator is approximately very close to the numerator, then you end up close to 100% of your investment showing up. 100% uh, of your input showing up as your investment. Does that make sense? So um, similarly, here as well, you want to make sure that the ratio of this guy, this you want to make sure that this resistance, 100 kilo ohms, is much bigger than this resistance. So what you're really what really is happening here is you're losing 1% of the signal because the ratio is one, okay? Here, um, one is 100K and one is um, 1000K. So you're losing a big chunk, 10%. The signal loss here is 10%, but the ratio here is much um, smaller, okay? Or in other words, um, so you're only losing 1% signal loss over there. And then you're losing another 10% signal lost over here because the ratio is one to 10, okay? And then there's another 10% signal lost here because the ratio is 10. So these ratios, if you had any choice, what you could do is to play around with the values of these resistances, RO and RL, so that the ratios are carefully chosen. Okay, and that's exactly the reason why you would want to you would want to um, have an additional stage. Okay, an additional stage of gain one. Let me talk about that. Let me show you the example that I'm thinking about. Okay, here is the stage. Right? Let's say um, somehow because of some bad advice you saw that there is, um, um, let's say you have, uh, um, I don't know, what was the value over there? 818 million dollars, right? 818 million dollars. And you saw that this was only giving a gain of one. So you felt that this gain was not necessary, okay? You felt that this gain was not necessary. So what you do is to get rid of this stage completely, okay? Get rid of this stage completely, okay? And directly connect, okay? This $818 million to this guy. What do you think happens here? So $818 million, or let's say not even $818 million, I was left with, 900 million dollars here right so 900 million dollars is what i had here oops that um, 900 million dollars is what i had here okay so this 900 million dollars okay you decided to directly cash this out cash out what do you think happens? What do you think your VL would be? VL would now be this $900 million, simple voltage division between the resistance here and the output resistance here. So it's going to be 100 ohms. Are you paying attention? Say that again. I think it will be 1100. But by 1100. Uh no, like the right. total will be 1100, I think. Yeah. 100 yeah. plus 1000. Yeah. So you, it seems your final cash out is going to be $900 million by 100, by 11. Okay, let's see, let's do that number 900 divided by 11 is going to give me $81 million. Geez, what happened? What the heck happened here that my $900 million, okay, $900 million. I thought I was ready to cash out, okay? I thought I was ready to cash out through this resistance here to VL. What do you think happened here 
that gave me such a terrible loss, that, that such a terrible return. Bunch of uh, the signal was lost in the in the source of stage three. Source of stage three, right here, correct? Yeah. So this resistance, if you think about it, is one thousand ohms, one kilo ohms, while this guy is only one hundred ohms. So a big chunk of your signal is lost in this one kilo ohm resistance. So what you want to do is to not directly connect this large resistance to a small resistance. Load resistance is small, right? You cannot directly connect them. You have to have an intermediate stage so that the resistances are matched, okay? So that the resistances are matched here. So now this one kilo ohm it's not directly connected to a small value, but instead it is connected to a bigger ratio. It is connected to a 10 kilo ohm resistance, okay? Which has an output resistance of 10 ohms to 100 ohms. So the idea is you want to pay careful attention to the fact that this commission resistance is much smaller than the payout resistance. Okay, if you don't do that, if you don't, um, if you're not careful, what happens is, um, and I'm going to redraw that again. If you're not careful, what happens is, um, if you directly connect, you're doing the mistake of um, making the commission resistance much bigger than the payout resistance. You, you shouldn't do that, you can't do that. So what you have to do is to have an intermediate state so that um, you can have this transition, okay? So that's the idea of using a gain state. So that should also go back to answer your question about why use multiple stages, okay? Well, you're not just trying to get gain out of a stage. You also have to make sure that the impedances are properly matched, okay? Between the output stage and the output resistance, the load resistance and the output resistance, okay? So um, I, this is only to give you an intuition. As you know, all of the class videos are available online. So I welcome you to go through those videos and read them and, and watch those videos for a more formal um, solution and explanation. But I, I'm hoping to give you a more um, uh, intuitive understanding of uh, the idea of different stages, how matching of these resistances matters, okay? So as you can see, each of these commission resistance is much smaller compared to its corresponding payout resistance. Similarly, this resistance, commission resistance is much smaller compared to the payout resistance. Um, same here as well. The smaller, um, the commission resistance in comparison, the better. Okay, that's the idea. The idea of signal loss. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's move. Okay, let's move further from here. So that's the idea of uh, um, signal losses due to Ri and R naught, and that's the problem associated with different stages. Okay, so, um, and that's explained here. The first stage has an approximate 1% um, signal loss between stage one and stage two, approximate 10% loss from stage one and stage two, um, something um, so on and so forth. So you can also ask this question. So I welcome you to um, ponder um, about this question. Okay, how much um, would be the voltage gain if I swap stage one and stage three? Okay, so think about it. I just did one mental experiment, right? What if I completely eliminated stage three and directly connected the load resistance RL to stage two output? It's a disaster, okay, it's a disaster. Pennywise, pound foolish disaster, okay? Because of mismatch 
between resistances. Okay, now let's look at the uh, different kinds of amplifiers. Did I mention in the last class somewhere? If I go back, if I scroll back, uh, let's see, um, somewhere I should have mentioned that um, this guy. I'm interested in this guy. Okay, let me copy that. Output is gain times input. This is the characteristic of um, an amplifier, okay? Output or the final payout is the initial investment multiplied by the gain that you get, okay? So um, I can stretch this analogy a little further, okay? As you know, gain is the final overall gain we are interested in. When you, there can be different kinds of gains. is the eventual output V out over the input that you send in the source, okay? That's overall gain. And depending on where you look at the input and where you look at the output, there can be different kinds of, um, different kinds of uh, gains, okay? Now let's see, I'm interested in this expression, output is gain times input, okay? If the input is voltage and the output is voltage, then what I have is a voltage gain. Okay? It doesn't have to be that way. I can have an input current and an output current and your gain can be uh, current gain. Okay, current gain. So you can mix and match just like similar to saying, um, I can put in cash, okay? Invest in cash, um, put cash into stocks, and then um, cash out in stocks. Or you could even do, you could say, I'm going to invest in commodities, okay? And then trade in commodities and measure my gain in terms of um, um, the increase in the amount of commodities they gain. Or you could mix and match. Your input could be in cash, okay? And your output could be in um, commodities through a gain, okay? So this is called, um, this is called uh, uh, the output is I, no, it, it's this guy, I'm sorry. Um, the output is, uh, the input is current I in, okay, I in, that's right here, I in. And then there is the output voltage right here. Okay, so that's GM, you can think of that as, uh, as RM, okay? So input is current, output is voltage. Okay, the opposite is also true, you can do an input voltage and then take the output as current. That will give you transconductance, GM amplifier. So there are four different kinds of amplifiers depending on what your input and what your output are, okay? So if you look at the first one, the input is a voltage, the output is a voltage. So I have a voltage gain, okay? Similarly, if you look at the second one, okay? The input is a current, the output is a current, so you have a current gain, AI. Similarly, if you look at this guy, the third one, the input is a voltage, okay? The output is a current. See, that's the current right there, okay? See, that's the current right there, okay? That's the current, output is the current. Therefore, um, you have what is known as a transconductance amplifier, transconductance amplifier. Okay, if the opposite is true, if the input is a um, current and the output is a voltage, see this dependent source tells me that it's a voltage, plus minus tells me it's a voltage. Input is current, output is voltage, then I have a trans impedance amplifier, okay? So given are the gains here, for a transconductance amplifier, which is number three, the input is voltage, the output is current. You can think of this as an example of a MOSFET. A MOSFET typically at its heart um, behaves 
like a transconductance amplifier okay you can later convert it to a voltage amplifier as well but at the heart it's a um, transconductance amplifier okay yes. number two current amplifier is a bipolar junction transistor is an example beach did okay yeah questions uh, the, like my question was like do we cover like Thevenin theorem and Norton theorem because like we have some questions in the quiz too yeah we'll cover uh, I can talk about that I can talk about Thevenin and Norton equivalent um, let me we, we can talk about that um, shortly okay. okay how to how to determine the Thevenin and Norton equivalent of it. Okay, but hopefully by the time we do enough problems, a couple of problems um, in the upcoming examples, we use that concept. So we, I hope I'll be able to illustrate that to you shortly. Okay. Now there are four kinds of amplifiers. There's a voltage amplifier. There's a current amplifier. There's a transconductance. And a trans impedance. It's also shown as trans resistance here, which is the same as trans impedance. Okay, so for example, the output is a voltage, input is a current. I have a trans impedance. Output is a current, input is a voltage. I have a trans conductance, so on and so forth. You see the idea, right? I don't want to beat this to death. Okay, so here is a technique. Here is a technique for finding out. I mentioned earlier that the output resistance is very important, okay? You want to make sure that um, the ratio between the load resistance and output resistance is properly matched, okay? If, if they're not properly matched, your gain is decimated, okay? You hear the word decimated being thrown around a lot often and often again um, it really means being multiplied by 110 right so that's exactly literally two in this case no um, that's really true in this case so if i look at this um, figure okay so that's uh, really true so the idea is sometimes what happens is and i'm going to show you um, Sometimes what happens is all of this um, behave like a black box, okay? So, so a lot of times you don't, you may not have an idea of what the output resistance is of the last stage or what the input resistance is into the first stage. So you have to have some way some mechanism of finding that out okay so if you take an amplifier and you may find yourself in a situation where you don't know what the resistance is looking in to that and i just mentioned that you need to know that because if you're not careful there could be a terrible signal loss um, if the input resistance is not small compared to the load resistance, then you're going to lose a lot of that signal, correct? So um, in order to make sure that you're properly choosing the value of load resistance or designing the, um, designing the amplifier in such a way that, that this resistance is small, what you want to do is you want to have a technique to find out the resistance looking in. What is the resistance looking in to that? Okay, typically what the question you're really asking is, okay, if I have an amplifier that looks like this, what is the, I'm interested in finding out the resistance looking into this, or um, out. What is the resistance looking into this? In order to do that, you apply what is known as a test voltage, test current method, 
okay? So you apply a voltage, test voltage Vx, and I'm going to show that to you using an example. And then um, analytically find the value of Ix, okay? Then if you want to find the value of R out, all you have to do is Vx over Ix. So at any particular node, if you have to find out the resistance, all you have to do is apply a test voltage and look at the test current and derive the expression for Vx over Ix, okay? And when you're doing that, you will make sure that you're killing the independent um, sources, okay? So any independent voltage source is shorted to ground. Any independent current source is open circuited. I'll show that to you in an example, okay? So let's say you have an amplifier with some input, okay? In order to calculate the, let's say you have an amplifier that has an input that looks like so. So in order to calculate the output resistance of the amplifier, the first thing you do is to make the input zero. So if the input is a voltage, you connect it to a ground. If the input is a current, you open circuit. So you make the input zero. Then you apply a test voltage, look at the test current, divide the test voltage by the test current. Okay, so that's the idea. We see this in action um, using an example later on. Okay, so now let's talk about the idea of amplified frequency response. Okay, when your input is a sine wave, okay, when your input is a sine wave, let's see, this tell you, no fail. Okay, input is a sine wave of some particular frequency. So the idea is this amplifier has different gains for different frequencies. Okay, an amplifier, uh, an ideal amplifier should um, amplify all frequencies at the same um, gain, with the same gain. But it, uh, in reality, it's not always the case. There is um, low pass amplifiers. There is a low pass, um, high pass, the band pass, so on and so forth, which selectively amplify. So the idea is different frequencies, okay, different frequency signals experience different gain. Okay, different frequencies experience different gain. And we want to have a sense of how the gain is changing with frequencies, okay? So the reason is most signals contain many frequencies, okay? Most signals contain many frequencies. Example, a music signal has anywhere between 20 to 20 kilohertz, right? There are a bunch of different frequencies between this human audible range, right? And then, a good amplifier, a good um, amplifier should be able to give, amplify all the different frequencies with the same um, gain. Or if you want to amplify just the high frequencies, okay, when I said a good amplifier, somehow my Google Assistant got active. Okay, so now um, if you want only to amplify the lower frequencies, you want to pick such an amplifier, which is going to act as a low pass filter and going to attenuate higher frequencies. If you want to amplify only the higher frequencies, okay, you should be able to choose that. So the idea is you can um, create an amplifier, you can understand an amplifier and you can design an amplifier, which has very specific um, frequency selective components, um, frequency response. That's called frequency response, okay? What is the gain at different frequencies? So when you're um, calculating the, when you're understand, when, a, when you're trying to understand the frequency response of an amplifier, what you typically do is plot the frequency 
on the x-axis and look at the gain on the y-axis, okay? How is the gain at different frequencies, at lower frequencies, at higher frequencies, so on and so forth, okay? Typically, we like to keep the x-axis as, um, as a logarithmic scale, decade scale, and the y-axis as a logarithmic scale as well. So this is going to be 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, so on and so forth. Okay, so when I'm talking about amplifier frequency response, I'm trying to get a sense of how the gain is going to change as a function of frequency. Okay, that is what I'm interested in finding out. Sometimes I also pay attention to phase. Okay, so if you think about it, this sine wave me erase all of this now so this sine wave that is going in okay does not have any phase but the output has some phase okay so what you want to pay attention to is um how phase is changing as a function of frequency okay how the phase angle is changing. so understanding these two understanding the dependence of gain as a function of frequency, understanding the dependence of um, phase angle as a function of frequency, as another function of frequency, that is the idea of frequency response. Okay. Okay. So to that, um, to towards that um, goal we do what is known as a body plot okay only one half of the body plot is shown the magnitude of the body plot is shown as you can see on the x-axis is um, frequency on the y-axis is the logarithmic scale of gain okay so let's pay attention to a certain things here this amplifier seems to have a constant gain for a wide range of frequencies okay for a wide range of frequencies, this amplifier seems to have a constant gain, okay? And at higher frequencies, at higher frequencies, the gain begins to roll off, okay? Um, if you make some crude approximations here, um, if, I'm, if I can approximate the response of this amplifier here, I'm going to um, show it like so, okay? So the gain of the amplifier is, oops, sorry. Okay. This is the approximation I'm going to make. And the idea is that um, at low frequencies, the frequency, the gain is going to go up. And at high frequencies, the gain is going to go down. Okay, But for a wide bandwidth, the amplifier seems to have a good gain, a constant gain, okay? That's the idea, that's a good thing, okay? The gain of most amplifiers is constant over a wide range of frequencies. It's often called mid-band frequencies, okay? And the gain of all amplifiers rolls off at high frequencies, and this is due to parasitic capacitances. Parasitic capacitances, in the transistor circuits, okay? The transistor circuits, which are used to build the amplifiers, they have some inherent capacitances in the picofarad range, okay? Capacitances in the picofarad range, okay? They tend to contribute to this roll off in frequency at high frequencies, okay? Also, at low frequencies, these are external capacitances that the designer can choose, external cap. The designer may have some uh, uh, leeway in terms of picking the load capacitances, usually in the orders of uh, microfarads, tens of microfarad, one to um, hundreds of microfarad range. 
Okay, so as you can see, um, there is uh, the external capacitances and there's also the coupling capacitances. Capacitances that are used to couple between two stages. So if I scroll here, this capacitance, CC, coupling capacitance that is used to DC couple, um, filter out any DC between two different stages and only pass the AC signal to amplify, that contributes to the low frequency roll off, okay? Low frequency roll off of the gain. As you approach low frequencies, the gain is going to roll off and that is compensated, that is contributed by the uh, coupling capacitance here, okay? The parasitic capacitances that are inherent to the transistors contribute to the high frequency roll off. Okay, that's the idea. So here is an example of capacitively coupled amplifiers. Two stages are capacitively coupled, meaning that this capacitance acts as an open circuit to DC. So the DC conditions of this stage does not affect the DC biasing of this stage. So what is transferred is the small signal, AC, that is being um, coupled from one stage to another stage. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the idea. The idea is that um, capacitances can be used for coupling. So amplifiers typically that are built on PCBs, printed circuit boards, okay, use discrete components, uh, coupling capacitances, okay. Integrated circuits typically do not use these coupling capacitances because they're extremely large in size and they consume a lot of silicon real estate, which is a bad thing, okay? So we avoid um, to the extent possible coupling capacitances in integrated circuits, okay? So I talked about amplifier frequency response. Along the x-axis is the frequency. Along the y-axis is the gain in dB, okay? So I have a, um, I have three kinds of amplifiers here. Shown here is an AC coupled. Okay, I can say it is AC coupled because it has a low frequency roll off. Low frequency roll off can only happen with high capacitances, okay, because of coupling capacitances. Remember, this contributes to the um, external capacitances coupling capacitances, okay? So the presence of a low frequency roll off here tells me that this is an, an AC coupled amplifier, okay? The roll off at this high frequency um, tells me that there is no AC coupling, there's only parasitics. So this is direct coupled. There is no AC coupling or no cap capacitive coupling here, no coupling cap because there is no low frequency roll off okay so these are two kinds of um, amplifier frequency response then there is a tuned amplifier frequency response in which you carefully pick the values of the coupling capacitances you can um, you can add in uh, some parasitic capacitances you can add some load capacitance, some parasitic capacitances as well. Somehow you manipulate the value of these capacitances such that um, the, you manipulate the capacitances such that um, you have a narrow band um, at amplification, tuned amplification, band pass filter. So this is a low pass filter, this is an AC coupled um, wide band filter, and this is a low pass filter, uh, a, a, a tuned band pass filter, okay? Um, professor, can you explain AC coupling again a little bit? Yes. So the idea is that when you have Two stages. Yes. There are two stages. There's a small um, signal coming out of this stage. That guy is amplified over here. Right? So this is much smaller. 
okay? Let's say you want another amplification stage. Okay, so um, let's say you want another amplification stage. Okay, you want this stage on top of this amplification stage to make your amplifier gain much bigger. So you started out with a small signal, you amplified it in the first stage, and you have a further amplification in the second stage. Okay, the idea of AC coupling is if you pay attention, there is a DC value around which this, there is an AC signal, right? So this could be zero or this could be five volts or anything, okay? This is a small um, 5.01, 4.99, okay? Does that make sense? Yes. So a DC value is five, on top of that, there is a small 0 0.1 AC value, okay? By coupling, by decoupling the DC, what you're doing is, you're, you don't have to make sure that this is also at five volts now, okay? So the input of this guy and the DC level at this, they can be decoupled. It doesn't really matter. Um, so in other words, the input of this guy could be biased at a DC value of 10, okay? So you're only um, coupling the 10.01 value, 9.99 value. So that really small 0 0.01 value is what you are, that you call the AC signal, okay? This 10 is the DC signal. So by AC coupling, what you're doing is you're breaking any relationship between this five volts and this 10 volts. If there is no AC coupling, then there is a requirement that both transistors operate at the same voltage level, okay? By AC coupling, you're only um, considering, you're only coupling the AC signal variation component of it, okay? So the bottom line is, by AC coupling, you're simply transferring the AC signal and you're um, suppressing the DC signal. That is what you want to understand. Does it make sense? Yeah, so like the capacitor over here, it like capacitor yes. really blocks DC and passes AC. Right? Yes, so, yes, the capacitor bo blocks DC and passes AC. Whatever is changing, that is passed, yeah. Okay, and so the the DC is passed to to the ground to resistor. No, it simply blocks when the DC value when the um, when the uh, um, it's not passed to ground. It simply does not show up on the other side. It doesn't show up on the other. It acts as an open circuit. Okay, oh, when you're okay. seeing it from the other side. It appears like an open circuit. Oh. So okay, there's no DC signal that's passing through. Only a small AC signal comes through. So like the resistor we are using in between two amplifiers, what is the use of it? This represents the input resistance of the next stage. Oh. So most often times you are not the one um, putting the resistance there. That's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, it usually comes from the input of the next stage. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, that's a good question. So when I mean AC coupling, uh, when I say in, so this is something we know already, right? The capacitance acts as a short to DC and an open circuit to high frequency. Okay. This is a DC to open circuit to high frequency. We use that notion over and over again. Okay, other questions please. I'll be asking uh, something in relate to that DC and AC coupling. Uh, 
still kind of uh, confusing for me. Um, so it seems like the only signal go going through that capacitor is just the change in the AC um, coming out of the first uh, amplifier. But what happens if we have a DC coupling? I don't have this capacitance here, okay? Then you have to pay a lot of attention to designing the second stage, okay? So in other words, um, you cannot independently design this second stage. Um, you have to pay a lot of, your second stage design gets very clumsy because that is affected by the DC value here, okay? And that's not a good thing. It gives you problems when you're designing the second stage. And I don't want to make it any more um, complicated than that. I want to keep it simple. The idea that if you're, if you're letting the DC value of this affect the bias conditions here, then that gives, you, gives us a problem of independently biasing this. We cannot independently bias this. The bias of this value or the DC operating condition now depends on the DC um, operating condition of the previous stage, which is not what you want. You want to break that dependence. You want to have the freedom of being able to bias this independently of this stage. So you put a capacitor in there. Therefore, anything that you do as DC here does not um, depend on the DC value here, DC1, DC2. So you can play around with this DC value independently without having to worry about what is in there. Does that make sense? I see. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So that's the use of DC coupling, of coupling cap, AC coupling capacity. Okay. When you're connecting two stages, you want to pay careful attention to the fact that you have to design them and you want to break the dependence of one design over the previous design as much as possible, okay? You want to keep them independent. Now, this idea, okay? This C and R, what are the units of the product of R and C? If you multiply R and C, what value do you think you get? Time. I'll be seconds. Time, seconds. So strangely enough, and uh, um, not readily intuitive, is the fact that the product of um, R and C has units of time. So we time, we'd like to call this time constant, when there is one R and one C, we like to call this a single time constant, okay? There can be two kinds of single time constant. If you can see, um, one is a high pass, this is called a high pass circuit, and this is called a low pass circuit, okay? Low, low pass. And that has to do with the, um, that has to do with the relative positioning of the capacitance um, and the resistance here. Okay. If you measure the output across the capacitance, um, or you measure the output across the um, resistance, that determines um, that determines the um, behavior. Now, okay. So the idea is this notion of the product of R times C has a lot of intuitive significance. One over R C naturally has units of frequency, radiance, okay? If you do one over two pi RC, then you have radiance, um, you have um, hertz, okay? So the idea is owing to the fact that R times C, usually um, it contributes to delay, um, it contributes to various artifacts, okay? So here is the idea in the Laplace domain, the impedance of a capacitance is one over S times C, where S is J omega, okay? One over J omega C. 
Okay, let's try to intuitively understand why this circuit behaves like um, a low pass filter. Okay, like I mentioned, the thing, the uh, idea we want to remember is capacitance acts as an open circuit to DC and acts as a short circuit to AC. Okay, so let's say I have a really high frequency, which is AC signal, then my capacitance acts as a short. Okay, my capacitance acts as a short. Okay, my capacitance acts as a short. There is this resistance force here. There is this resistance. Okay, to high frequencies, the capacitance um, acts as a short, and then um, if you look at the um, high frequencies here, the high frequencies are passed through. Okay, the high frequencies are passed through, and the voltage that you see here um, is a high pass. Okay. Question. The ID is, yes. On, on the low pass, if we add a yes. resistor before or after the capacitance, is that is still a low pass uh, circuit? Yes. The idea is the reason is this. This acts as the shot. Okay. This acts as the shot. The idea is what is the voltage that you see here at really, really high frequencies? Mm -hmm. Zero, right? Because it's a shot. So you can almost forget that this is a capacitance. It acts like a short circuit, and the voltage that you see across that is zero. So it is attenuating high frequencies and passing um, low frequencies at really, really high frequencies. I think I may have said it all backwards, okay? At really high frequencies frequencies this acts as the shot but as low frequencies at low frequencies or at dc the capacitance disappears it acts as an open circuit okay cap acts as an open circuit to dc okay so this capacitance disappears so the voltage vi shows up across here okay so at low frequencies low frequencies, output voltage is the same as the input voltage. How about at high frequencies? At high frequencies, this acts as a shot, okay? So the voltage here is zero, okay? So at really high frequencies, high frequencies, the voltage output is zero. So if you think about it, low frequencies are passed, High frequencies are blocked, so you have a low pass filter. Okay, let's do the same um, um, interesting analysis one more time here. Okay, on the side of the high pass circuit. Okay, in the high pass scenario, at really high frequencies, this acts as a shock. Okay, there is no voltage drop here. So if you look at the voltage V out, at high frequencies, that is going to be V in, right? That is because all of this voltage is going to drop across this resistance, okay? And there is nothing here in the capacitance, okay? Now at low frequencies, at really low frequencies, this capacitance blocks, okay? This capacitance acts as an open circuit. This cap acts as an open circuit. So this is high frequency the output is the same as input. At low frequencies, the V out, there's no current flowing here. So that's going to be zero. So at low frequencies, um, there is attenuation and high frequencies are passed. Hence, we call the idea of high pass circuit on this side. The opposite is true on this guy, which is the low pass circuit. Okay, so um, it's easy to do, uh, it's easy to do a, um, 
voltage division. It's easy to do a voltage division for um, frequencies between extremely low and extremely high. You're simply doing a voltage division between ZC and R. That's all there is to the transfer function for uh, low pass or high pass filter. Questions, please. So okay, why so do we need the, uh, oh, the resistor in parallel to the load on the high pass if, if it's just an open circuit at low frequency? So why do we, it, it, I guess, why do we need that parallel resistance? The, why do we need the, the R uh, in parallel with the V outload, the high pass? It's just an open circuit at low frequency. Correct, but this is there to, at high frequencies, this is what gives your, uh, this is what uh, uh, gives your output voltage. At high frequencies, what happens is, um, this acts as a shock, okay? And you have to have some kind of mechanism to drop your voltage, okay? Oh, Measure okay, so, voltage. so that R is the load. Okay, never mind. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so, like, this is the circuit for like the low pass filter and high pass filter. Um, a, 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 some version of this. Okay, at the heart, this is low pass and high pass. When it comes to filters, there's a bit more design that you have to do. You put some amplifiers, um, operational amplifiers, in front of it. But at the heart, this is the uh, operating um, principle. Okay. So the outputs, if you see, pretty much operates like a low pass filter. And the answer to your question can be yes, um, but you, there, there's scope for improving on that. Okay, so let's look at the idea of the, uh, how much time do I have? Four minutes, right? I'm going to, let's see, do this, add a page, and leave you with the idea of body part single, um, for single pole. Single pole meaning there is just one R and just one C, okay? Single pole, single RC for a um, low pass filter. The response for a low pass filter is going to be something like this, okay? This is the body plot. On the top is the gain, magnitude of gain in dB, okay? And on the x-axis is frequency in logarithmic scale, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, so on, 10,000, 100,000, mega, 10 mega, 100 mega, so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to make some crude approximations here. Let's say I have a pole at one per, some frequency, okay? I have, let's say that guy is my pole, one over two pi RC. The values of R and C are such that, oh, why don't I uh, move that a little further, okay? So I'm going to assume that there's a pole frequency over here, okay? Assume the pole frequency over here. So the values of R and C are such that um, the one over two pi RC happens to be sitting um, at that value, frequency value, okay? That particular frequency value. Now, how do I draw the body plot, okay? Uh, let's say there is a DC gain of uh, whatever. So the crude approximation of, so the DC gain value is that guy. Okay, the DC gain value is that guy, gain at low frequencies. So the idea is the crude approximation for how the gain changes with respect to the um, pole frequency is it begins to roll off at crude um, negative 20 dB per decade. It begins to roll off at this pole frequency, one by two pi. RC. If there is one R and one C 
in my circuit and um, the gain begins to roll off at this. This is called single pole response. Okay, and then um, how the phase behaves is a little interesting. The phase be begins to roll off at 10 times below and it continues to roll off at 20 times um, until 10 times above. So if you plot the phase, it's going to be constant and from there to there, it's going to roll off and then it's going to remain constant. So here is the idea and I'll uh, leave this and we'll come back in the next class. The pole begins to, if this is your pole frequency, 10 times below the pole frequency, the phase begins to roll off at minus 45 degree per decade. Okay, I, you want to etch this on your forearm, um, tattoo this on your forearm or something. These are fundamentally set, okay, by the um, behavior of RNC circuits. And at 10 times the pole frequency, it begins to stop its effect. Okay, so if your phase was to was zero to begin with, exactly at the pole frequency, your phase will be negative 45 degrees, and um, 10 times above it will be 90 degrees, and uh, uh, and that's about it. It'll reach there asymptotically, and we'll talk about this more in the next class. The idea though is one pole provides a phase shift of 90 degrees. Okay, one. Uh, pole provides a gain roll off of 20 dB per decade. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll come back to talk about this in the next class.